Hello, I am Jan Oberg. I am the director of the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research, TFF, in Lund, Sweden. And I am very, very happy and honored to participate in this hugely important event. And my subject is, what will the implications be of Sweden and Finland joining NATO, as was basically decided last year. And my overall conclusion is it will reduce the security for all the countries in the Nordic region. But let me get started. Since 1945, the Nordic countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland, have chosen different security political solutions but they adhered to the idea of what we used to call Nordic balance. When making decisions, each would take into account the others and be sure not to do anything harmful to them. Interestingly, this flexible and diverse policy for the region has served all quite well, whereas they would never have agreed to form a defense alliance with one policy that would apply to all of them. Once upon a time, Finland's president, Uro Kekkonen, stood for policies of active neutrality, a go-between role and in initiating the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, a tremendously important organization. Finland was proud that its people felt that neither the East nor the West was an enemy. They had what we called equidistance. And that was during the height of the First Cold War, when the Warsaw Pact was about 10 times stronger in proportion to NATO than Russia is today. One reason was that European policies had an intellectual foundation and leaders a consciousness about what war meant. That is not the case today. By joining NATO, the two different neutrals, or neutrals in different ways, Finland and Sweden, have now abandoned all that served them well for so long. Old-time members, Denmark and Norway, have changed to accept foreign troops and pre-positioning of weapons on their territory. Iceland remains an unarmed member of NATO, providing the Keflavik base. These policy changes imply that the Baltic Sea is no longer a neutral buffer zone. It is now a NATO sea. And that means that the adversaries, US slash NATO and Russia, are coming much closer in confrontation, animosity, even hate. And that again means much shorter time available to react in a crisis situation particularly if military equipment and infrastructure is in place and perhaps foreign troops are already deployed in peacetime. US-Finnish negotiations about the Defence Cooperation Agreement that will provide access for US forces to a number of military bases near the Russian border have taken place since September last year. Sweden long ago got a host nation support agreement with the US. So everything is basically prepared for militarizing these huge territories. Norway has accepted US bases on its territory for the first time since it became a member. And the Danish government has announced to everybody's surprise that negotiations about US bases there have gone on for many months. From the perspective of limitless militarism and the interests of the military, industrial, and media academic complex, complex, what I call MIMAC, the military, industrial, media academic complex, these developments, of course, are good news. But from the perspective of peace, stability, human security, free policymaking, national sovereignty, as well as human and regional common security, each and all combined are plain disastrous for this region. 
In addition, they are scandalous from the point of democratic decision making. For instance, according to the Swedish Svenska Dagbladet daily of May 6, 2022, only 48% thought that Sweden should join NATO. But in just one week, those who were not secure what to think had increased from 22 to 27. Sweden never had a decent, multifaceted and consequence-oriented debate about its membership, giving up 200 years of successful peace policies. Negotiations came sneaking. Media blow up the Russian threat beyond any rationality with reference to its invasion of Ukraine, which, whatever else you may think of it, is a rather limited affair and not the beginning of a domino-like conquest of one NATO country after the other. On the contrary, it is NATO which, in breaking promises made to Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev 30 years ago, it is NATO that has expanded politically and militarily up under the skirts of Mother Russia. Had the US been situated where Russia is today, with Washington in Moscow, it would have stopped such coming close years ago, if necessary, by military force. That was a parallel to the Cuban Missile Crisis. What is this likely to mean in the future? Well, the traditionally low tense Nordic area, close to the contested and increasingly contested Arctic region, will become a higher tension area. The Swedes and the Finns will become less secure. There will be harder confrontation and polarization instead of soft borders and mediating attitudes. In a serious crisis, they will be occupied and told what to do by the US-NATO world. The countries will not be able to say no to peacetime requests for establishment of US bases and other preparations for war. With over 600 bases worldwide, one would think that the US had enough bases, but that does not seem to be the case. Like Denmark and Norway, they will be expected to deliver fighting capacity around the world where one or more NATO countries are at war. Such missions will, in most cases, like Denmark's role as an occupier in Iraq from 2003 to 2007, undermine the best international long-term interests and instead make them rogue states in the eyes of the locals where they intervene. It should be remembered that NATO is no longer a North Atlantic defensive alliance, but an offensive global organization with not only 30, 32 members, but 40 partners, that's what they call them, in addition to these European members. That means over 70 countries in the world are now involved somehow in NATO operations, way outside, by the way, of NATO's own treaty. There will be virtually no confidence building and conflict resolution mechanisms left in Europe. Also no arms control agreements. No discussion will be possible about a new all European peace and security system. Russia has been canceled, isolated, uh, or so they think, at least from Europe. And whether it is understood and respected or not, Russia will feel even more intimidated, isolated, and in certain imagined conflict situation, perhaps become desperate. As does normally a weaker party in an asymmetrical conflict. It will cost a fortune for Finland and Sweden to fully become NATO interoperable. And when they have joined, they cannot refuse, refuse to pay the price. And that price will be high. In other words, the famous cat in the bag. You've gone into something you do not know the end result of. Citizens will be forced to pay through their noses and witness both their living standards go down and their security decrease. 
As NATO members, Finland and Sweden cannot but share the responsibility for nuclear weapons. That's a very important point. The offensive deterrence and possible use of them by NATO. It is Nuclear weapons is an integral part of NATO's military doctrine, or warfighting doctrine. US vessels may bring nuclear weapons into the, their ports, but they will of course not even ask whether they have nuclear weapons on board or not, because they know that the arrogant US response is, we neither confirm nor deny. This did not prevent the present Swedish Prime Minister, Mr. Christensen, from going to NATO's headquarter on the third day of his Prime Minister status and declare without any mandate in Sweden that his country would live up to all obligations in NATO, including its nuclear doctrine. No media reacted to that addition, that he has no mandate for in Sweden. There will be much less de facto sovereignty and decision-making possible. De jure sovereignty has been abandoned and Sweden bows to President Erdogan's every demand. The days when Sweden and Finland can, in principle at least, work for alternatives are numbered. That is, for the UN Treaty on Nuclear Abolition and the UN Goal of General and Complete Disarmament, any alternative policy concepts like common security, human security, a strong UN, etc. They won't be able to serve as mediators and no NATO member can pay anything but lip service to such noble goals. NATO is not a liberal institution that promotes alternatives. It's a juggernaut that eradicates them. Finland and Sweden now also pledge their future to militarist thinking, to peace in quotation marks paradigms that are imbued with weapons, armament, long range and large destructive offensive capacity, offensive deterrence and constant provocations. NATO is human history's most militaris militaristic organization. Its leader, the United States of America, has been at war 225 out of 243 years since 1776. And according to Brown University Cost of War Project, has killed 900,000 people directly and 3.6 million indirectly since 9-11-2001, predominantly in the Middle East. Every idea about nonviolence, the UN Charter provision about making peace by peaceful means, which is the content of Article 1 in the Charter, uh, which is central, by the way, to NATO's own treaty, all this is out of the window. Finally, by joining NATO, the two countries will be forced to side with a larger West in the future world order change in which China, the Middle East, Africa, South America, whatever we call the Global South, as well as huge non-Western non regional association will gain strength and the West will decline. The US priority number one is China. As NATO members, Sweden and Finland will be unable to walk on two legs in the future, a Western leg and a non-Western leg, and will decline and fall with the West, the US empire and NATO in particular. Tragically, one must conclude, therefore, that Sweden and Finland lack the intellectual power and, the f and freedom to see the larger a picture in time and space. NATO has had the time since 1949 to prove that with its philosophy it can make peace. We know now that it can't. Joining it is therefore a huge gift to militarism and future warfare instead of the much needed and eminently possible peace with human security, global security, cooperation in the forthcoming uh, multipolar world. I'm sorry I've not been more optimistic 
about the future, but it's very difficult sitting in Sweden and having followed these developments the last 30, 40 years. I wish you a very good continuation and thank you for your attention to my little lecture here. Thank you.